Hi, my name is Carrie Barnes. I am the creator of the Cam Matrix, and today we are here with John Snow of Platinum Tree Management. I'm not going to give you an intro, John. I'm going to let you give us the intro on on all of your experience and expertise in uh, as an arborist. Sure thing. Thanks, Carrie. Appreciate you having me here today on the Ask an Arborist session. Uh, super excited to be here. As far as my background, I'm actually a board certified master arborist. I've been practicing arboriculture for 27 years now. Uh, I got my start actually working on golf courses. And after a couple, about two, three years, I went into doing uh, commercial and residential tree care up in Chicago where our primary niche market was dealing with townhomes and condo HOA associations up there. And since I did that for 11 years up there, and then I moved to Hilton Head, where I continued to do the same. And now I'm down here in the Tampa Bay area serving this community. So um, most of my experience has been pretty exclusive working with townhomes, condos, HOA associations. Um, that's kind of the niche market that I, I've always worked in, and I enjoy working with uh, communities. Well, great. We really appreciate you taking the time today to come on here and uh, answer questions that people have about tree care. I think that one thing I wanted to play really quickly was this little video uh, that talks a little bit about this 2019 law. and. Sure. Give me just a minute. Let's see. I got to find it. Part of preparing for hurricane season is making sure those trees that are around your home don't pose a risk if a storm were to hit. Up until recently, if you wanted to remove a tree on your property, you probably had to get a permit from the city or the town that you live in. But that is not the case anymore. A new law in Florida bans local governments from regulating tree removal and replanting on private property. Ted News reporter Liz Crawford found this law has both pros and cons. When there's a storm, we can almost count on it. Trees crashing into homes and knocking down power lines. That's why removing and trimming trees on your property is a good idea. A new law will help property owners be proactive without the permit. We would go pull the permit through the city and the city would approve or deny the permit. The new legislation called private property rights allows property owners to remove, replant, prune or trim a tree without approval from their local municipality. If a licensed arborist determines the tree poses a risk, you're free to do what you want with your tree. Thanks for sharing that, Carrie. That's that's awesome. And the House Bill 1159, the tree law that Florida enacted in 2019, is definitely a very important law that there's a lot of confusion about especially when it relates to HOAs, townhomes, and condo associations. So do you want to talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, I kind of go through it because it sounded like, okay, first of all, you cannot cut down a tree without a licensed arborist giving you uh, some kind of inspection on the tree. So it doesn't sound like, hey, I want to, I don't want this tree here anymore. I want to cut it down. That's not what the law is for. The law is for you to be able to remove a tree if it's dying or could cause property damage. Am I correct? Yes. That, I don't know. Explain that out for me. I guess that's where I'm confused. Well, there's a lot of confusion because the law, unfortunately, while the legislators have the best intent, the wording in the law is somewhat vague. So one of the areas is how do you define residential property? That's not defined within that statute. Basically, the consensus is regarding HOAs, townhomes, and condos, the law does not apply at all. So in other words, if you have a tree, you still need to go through the local municipality or county and get the approval. If you're a homeowner and you own the, the land that you're on, then that's where it, it fits in. But if you're a right. condo association or a homeowners association and it's on common area, you're saying it does not apply there. That is pretty much the current uh, consensus on that. That has yet to be formally defined. You know, 
I'm involved with Florida chapter of the International Society of Arboreal Culture. I'm actually on the Governmental Affairs Committee, and that's one of the things that we're trying to address is to get clarification on this law because it's, it's really opened up a whole th- gamut of problems. And as it relates to homeowners associations, townhomes, condos, you know, there's a lot of confusion. If the tree is on private property, it's a residential home. So say you're in a large HOA that has 2000 homes in that, and those homes are zoned residential. The association has its common grounds, but then the homeowners own the actual land. And I see that in many communities down here. Then in that case, the homeowner can remove that tree. But when it comes to the common spaces, then that's something where you still have to go through that permitting process. Now, here's the caveat on this. Many homeowners associations have their own rules relating to tree removal. That doesn't mean that the homeowners association rules don't apply because homeowners associations are not a local government. They are a homeowners association. What this law is restricting is the actual municipalities and the counties from applying this. But in order to do that, Another part of this equation goes back to, is the tree a danger? That's very loosely defined in the law. You could say, well, the tree is going to drop an acorn and put a dent in my car. Therefore, the tree is a danger. That's just not realistic. If that was the case, we'd be cutting down every tree, right? So, you know, you have to define that. That's another thing that's not clear within this law. Now, it talks about having an International Society of Arboreal Culture certified arborist write up documentation. It says obtains documentation is the actual wording in that statute. And the, the issue there is, are all ISA certified arborists technically qualified to determine whether or not a tree poses a danger. And there's actual standards that apply to this. It's a tree risk assessment. I'm a tree risk assessment qualified arborist, and that requires specialized training and knowledge. So there's actually 18 components for a tree to fall within the criteria of being considered more than just a low risk. Any tree poses some risk. The only way of alleviating all risk is to remove every tree. And that's just, again, not realistic. So it's a matter of really defining what is an acceptable level of risk. That's kind of a a little bit of a long-winded part of the whole thing. And there's, there's definitely a lot of components to this. And I'm looking forward to hopefully making some changes that are going to help really kind of define things a little bit better for everybody. Okay. Uh, let's get into some of these questions that we have on the CAM matrix. Sure. Jared Cruz from Leland Management has, has asked, number one, I lost a couple of large queen palms after the developer never cared for them. They were removed from the community, but I currently have a couple of palms on OTC to help prevent them from dying. What are some signs to look out for, especially with palm trees and the various diseases that are going around to know when it's time to get them removed and stop spreading to other trees? Good question. That's a great question. (laughs) It's interesting. He talks about OTC, which is oxytetracycline, okay, which is an antibiotic. And so The question that I would have there for Jared really would be, well, did you have the trees tested, number one, for lethal bronzing disease? I'm assuming that he's referring to lethal bronzing disease. The OTC, the oxytetracycline, is is the standard treatment for that disease. And so what ends up happening is basically you're coming in and doing these treatments to the palms 
to try to prevent the problem. So the first thing there, Jared, thanks for answering that, would be getting a confirmed test. You can definitely do the treatments, but you need to understand that's not really a very sustainable sort of a option. A lot of the research is coming out of the University of Florida, Dr. Bader down there, I've spoken with him, and actually they've come out with some newer research that basically indicates that there's a better way of managing these disease problems. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen if I can. Yeah, yeah, let me take this off. Also wanted to say, just to put this in, in audio, Jared answered not tested, was looked at and evaluated and it was recommended. Jared, I think I've unmuted you on your microphone, just so since he's answering your questions, you can able to speak if you would like. If you don't want to, you don't have to. <laughs> Go ahead, John. We can see your screen share now. Great. So this is a blog from the University of Florida, and they talk about some of the new data on the insect that's causing this disease. Okay. So what you need to understand, this is actually what we call leaf hopper which is an insect that's going from palm tree to palm tree and spreading the disease, okay? And really what the recommendation, is, here's Dr. Bader right here. Some of the key takeaways is that the current management of disease relies on tree removal and antibiotics, neither of which are sustainable. Thus managing the insect will be the way to control the disease. So the first line of defense is knowing where your insect is and when it is most abundant. And the way that that can actually be done is by using what we call sticky traps, and that can actually basically attract the insect. They'll get stuck to this trap, and then you can send that out to the University of Florida, and they can determine whether or not the leaf hoppers are present and whether or not they actually even have the disease. That's really a, a critical part of that because what ends up happening many times, Jared, is the palm may die from other causes. Okay, you said that it wasn't tested. And I think on your um, initial post there, it was because the developer never cared for those trees. And so if the disease wasn't properly identified, I think that that's gonna be a, a significant problem for that community you may just needlessly be spending a lot of money on these OTC treatments and the trees don't even necessarily need it. So I think the place to start would be to install some sticky traps. If you do have continued problems, there are actual tests that you can send out to the University of Florida. And that's, that's what we do is we would collect samples from the trees and then actually go in and send that to the University of Florida to to confirm whether or not the disease is actually present. I think that in many cases, it's it's a little overrated as far as the amount of palms that, that are actually being affected. Did you have any other questions on that, Jared? I think he says his mic's not working. Okay. But he says that kind of answered all his questions. And definitely, if you have any other questions on that, Jared, we can we can talk one on one a little bit more about that. OK, definitely I'm going to go back yeah. over to I'm going to go back over to more questions on the cam matrix. This one also came in from Jared. He asked, what are the best times of the year for tree trimming? I always recommend twice a year, right before hurricane season and just after hurricane season. This is especially true for any limbs touching near or over the roofs of buildings. Again, this is another fantastic question, you know, and, and a question I get asked quite frequently. Realistically, you can prune dead wood from a tree at any time of the year. When we get into these drought periods, that's when you want to avoid pruning trees because you're injuring the tree. And that's one of the key things is, is you need to understand that when you're pruning a tree, you're actually injuring the tree. And what that tree needs to do is actually seal over those wounds. As a rule of thumb, unless we can at all avoid it, you don't want to remove limbs that are larger than four inches in diameter, 
Okay, that's particularly important when we get into like your laurel oaks, your water oaks, some of your species like that. And the reason behind that is it takes significantly longer, the larger the wound, the larger, the longer period of time it takes for that wound to seal over, which allows an entry point for decay causing organisms. So when you're seeing these great big pruning cuts where somebody's lopped off a big bottom limb, you're actually doing a lot of harm to the tree. These cuts need to be much smaller, about like that. So that's kind of the first part of the question. The second part of the question there is like I mentioned in my comment there, how do I know if the tree needs to be pruned? And I think that really boils down to setting very clear objectives in your community. Jared, you mentioned the limbs that are touching or near or over the roofs. You need to establish within guidelines within each community of having proper height clearances over your roads, around street signs, lamps, roofs, sidewalks. Uh, typically, you know, over roads, we're looking for a minimum of 14 feet. That doesn't mean 30 feet. It means you need a minimum of 14 feet. So I think that that is where the conversations need to start. As far as frequency goes, again, that's going to be a variable. All trees don't need to be pruned every year. That's a mistake. You prune trees based on meeting specific objectives, removing dead wood maintaining clearances over structures, removing dangerous limbs. Aesthetics can be an objective. You want to improve the overall aesthetic. Reducing tree density, and that's a big one when it comes to the hurricanes. You want to reduce that overall density. And let me spell that one out, because this is very important and a big mistake that I see a lot of companies, a lot of tree care companies doing they'll go in and they will basically gut out the interior of the tree. And I think we've all seen that. Mm -hmm. It's very common. And so what needs to happen is you want to actually be pruning that outer third of that tree canopy. That's the part of the tree that's growing. So you want to be pruning those areas and target those areas. Most tree companies, what they'll do is they go up in the center of the tree and they'll just skin out a lot of the branches and stuff, whatever they can reach. And that's not thinning out the density. The density is the outer portion of that tree. So I see Jared plugged into the chat there and just trying to budget ahead of time. So trying to create a good tree maintenance program ahead of time is usually helpful rather than just trimming on a whim. And you're absolutely right. Community associations, in my experience, the number one failing as it relates to tree care is that people do not have a specific line item in their budget for tree care and management. And a lot of times it's just kind of this catch-all of a landscape extra. Here's what you need to understand, and this is what you need to communicate to your board members. Trees, typically your largest landscape feature. If they're not, they're probably going to grow and become the largest landscape feature that you have. And tree care can be very expensive. The best time to start pruning trees is when they're young. You want to train the trees. But the community really needs to establish a realistic budget based on the specific needs and the goals that the community has. So you can do pruning twice a year, and it might be phase one, phase two. There's a lot of different ways of wrangling the problem, but you just need to understand not every tree needs to be pruned every year. Typically, unlike oaks, it should be maybe every three years, unless there's some dead wood or a specific reason like a branch got broken in a seasonal storm. Does that answer most of your question there, Jared? Awesome. He said, yes, it does answer his question. And, you know, this brings up a good point that I wanted to make. I was just recently speaking with John Sowers of 
Yellowstone landscaping. And he said he actually came across, or he does come across this quite often, where community associations, they'll review their past expenses and they'll forget to put in tree trimmings back into the landscape category. They place it under like, I don't know, additional expenses or something. So when they go to look at their landscaping budgets in the past, it's not there under landscaping, it's under something else. So they're not really truly looking at what they're spending on landscaping. And I think it's really important for managers to think about that because it might be something that if, depending upon how it's, who's handling what, it might be something for managers to bring up to their communities that let's look at where we're placing all these items. Obviously, if a management company is handling all of your accounting and providing those types of financial budgets, they'll be on there. I'm not going to speak for management companies because I don't know, but mm -hmm. he said, yes, he itemizes the items to know where we, where we're spending. And that's correct. So he's on top of it. But I think some communities, maybe in self-managed too, they don't think about that. And it's just good to know. I'm going to go down to the next question. Oh, I'm sorry. You're go absolutely ahead. right. Let me just kind of follow up on that a little bit, Carrie, because I, I think there needs to be a distinction between landscaping and trees within the budget. And, you know, what I do, the services that, that our company provides is really independent consultations to communities. And that's, and this is one area that we talk very in depth with them about is, you know, budgeting and, you know, setting aside that as a specific line item. You know, because there's a huge difference between trimming the trees and cutting the grass. No, I, I get grass. I get where you're coming from on that. I agree. But what I'm saying is when they're looking at it head on mm -hmm. under, from a budget standpoint, I totally understand that for their purpose needs to have it all under one item for the care of the aesthetics of the community, I guess is what, what I'm trying they, to say. Yeah, they really do. And I, I see a lot of communities the way that they have been managed, you know, and it's, and ultimately it's the board that's making these decisions, I think, is that, oh, well, this year we need to trim these trees. And so there's like this big kind of capital expense that comes in and that all goes back down to is they don't have a management plan for their trees. So, you know, you, you run this cycle of, well, hey, we're going to trim these trees this year and next year we don't need to do it. So then it falls off that budget. It looks really good from a financial standpoint, but the reality of it is, is if a good management plan in communities is to have a continuous ongoing cycle where you're maintaining your trees rather than it becoming this up and down expense, because a lot of most associations that I've dealt with, you know, it's kind of like a one time expense and then they might go 10 years before they do anything. And then when a hurricane hits, they wonder why there's so much damage and it's the tree's fault. No, it's because the trees weren't properly managed in the first place. So I'm going to get off my soapbox on that one. <laughs> okay. All right, so let's go down to the third question from Jared, which is, what are some trade secrets that you would be willing to share that would help prepare managers to be honorary arborist or know what to look out for and determine when we need a certified arbor arborist rather than a landscaping company telling us trees need to go? Sure. So I think this all starts with a key concept. You need to understand that trees have value. If you start with by looking at and thinking about, well, what would it cost if I had to replace that tree with the exact same tree? And is that even possible? I think a lot of communities look at trees, particularly when they're young, as disposable assets, and they're not. As trees continue to grow, as any manager knows that has dealt with tree removals, it can be a very, very expensive process. And so the real key there is, number one, 
getting a certified arborist involved, preferably one that's independent, that can go out and assess the situation of what it is that you need. And something that's going to develop a management plan. And I think, you know, some of the things that property managers can be doing is actually be when they're out on the property, looking up. People don't look up. And it amazes me because I've seen branches that are hanging over a sidewalk for months, if not years, and nobody's even noticed it. And it's like, wait a second. What happens if that limb falls and hits somebody? And people, oh, oh, we, we need to get that taken care of. And it goes back to, again, not having a management plan and not being proactive. So, you know, the biggest thing that a property manager can do is be proactive. Look up, looking for easy to spot problem areas. Yeah, but how do you put, tell, I'm sorry, how do you tell between because, you know, a lot of people say, well, we like the shade. So how do you tell between when a limb should be cut down and when it shouldn't? Is there like a guideline that you guys use? Again, it goes back to setting those objectives and, you know, what the expectations are. You can say, well, hey, if we want to get grass in this area, what's going to be required? Okay. One way is to elevate that tree. Another way of getting light in is to reduce the sides of the tree in some. A third method is to go in and thin out that canopy. It all depends upon the species of the tree, but there are no necessarily firm guidelines. Like I said, I'm a board certified master arborist. Right now in the state of Florida, there is no state licensing required to be an arborist. It's all voluntary uh, through the International Society of Arboriculture. And that's one of the things that we're hoping to change is actually have our arborists become licensed within the state because that's an important, very important first step because you go in the phone book and there may be 20 tree companies. Well, just because Joe has a pickup truck and a chainsaw doesn't mean that he's an arborist and knows what to cut and how to cut it. Again, it goes back to these standards. There's actually standards on pruning a variety of things. Here's one of the standards. I don't know if you can see that. This is one of the standards that we have. We have 10 different standards that we are required to follow. And that's another key component of being a certified arborist is you're required to follow these, these standards. So that's kind of a big separation between the landscape company and tree services. Do you have any recommendation of something like a site that they can go to that would, might help them? Absolutely. They go to treesaregood.com. Or dot org. I'm sorry. I'm going to go ahead and share this on my screen, and you can see right here. This is the trees are good. The other page here is the International Society of Arboriculture, and they have some information. But this is more for existing arborists. But for community managers and homeowners, they go to the treesaregood.org website. You can actually verify a credential. You can find an arborist. And there's some information about trees there. So we'll just kind of run through this very quickly. You can verify an ISA credential. We'll just type in this guy here. I happen to know this guy pretty well. And you can see it right there. It pulls me up. And so it doesn't see, pull up by name? It, it pulls up by the person's name, not by the company name? You, it will not come up by company name. It comes up by the individual. Um, that holds the license. But, exactly. But you can also go into find a professional. You can search by location. And I'm not a huge fan of the way they have it's set up, but you can select Florida 
and then let's just say Tampa. This may not pull me up in there, but that's fine. And it will list everybody who is a member of the International Society of Arboriculture, and it will tell you what credentials they have. So you can see here is another board certified master arborist and just an, a list of people some of which have the tree risk assessment qualification. Um, here's Ricky. He's my friend. Um, you know, a whole bunch of people there. So it unfortunately does not list it by companies. There is a, another company or another organization um, called the Tree Care Industry Association. And you can go in here and find a tree care company. So this is tcia.org. And I'm just going to type in my zip code. And you can see it pulls up, you know, this company here. But again, the problem with that is it doesn't say whether or not they actually employ a certified arborist. Spelled that wrong. I'm putting it in the chat. TCAI, TCIA.org. Okay. And what the other one was, what was the website? I'll put it into the chat. Okay. Treesaregood.org. Okay. Yeah. What about, uh, here, here's kind of a question that came in and I don't know if this is controversial or not. <laughs> <laughs> um okay so the florida power fpo power company they have a tree line clearing program mm -hmm. do you ever come across something issues with the power companies the different i'm not asking you to name any power companies what i'm saying is do you ever come across any issues where the power company has come in and damaged a tree has the power company butchered a tree? Well, we know that. <laughs> well, I didn't say butchered. You said butchered. <laughs> but that's what you implied, Carrie. But um, I'm just saying her know, experience around my house. Unfortunately, you know, the standards for power lines are much different. Okay. And th there are standards that, that need to be applied there. That's not my area of expertise. But I can tell you this. Power companies have a, a right of way that they're obligated to maintain. And so what they do is they contract out with the tree care companies. And they, again, they set these objectives, these specifications. The trees need to be maintained X number of feet away from the power line. Unfortunately, that leaves a lot to be desired as far as overall tree health, and it can create tree issues. Definitely, you kind of get this V effect where, you know, you got this big old live oak and, and the power lines run right through the middle. It looks terrible, and nobody really wants that. Most of the tree care companies that are involved doing the um, – line clearance work is what we classify that um, those guys are professionals that do go through a lot of training a lot of particularly safety training because obviously when you're working around a power line you can get electrocuted those guys have gotten much better over the years as far as trying to make better pruning cuts and stuff like that again most of that's dictated by the power company, unfortunately. Yeah, and I, I mean, I get why they do what they do, but okay. Yeah, uh, there's not much that you can really do. You know, if you have a, um, a transmission line or something like that running through a community, they're going to do what they're going to do. And the most that you can really um, expect from them is to get um, notification that they'll be out on the property you can't dictate to them what what they can or can't do okay 
do you that another tree question? law actually even even addresses that uh, a little bit further down in that statute it says that it does not apply to power line claims do you okay so another question that came in do we start with a consultation of trees in our community and can we can we select a few trees in our community only that we want to have maintained sure i guess the question they're referring to is when dealing with platinum tree management can they say we've got a ton of trees in our community but we really only won't want you to look at these few or whatever you know ideally the best way of doing things is to look at all the trees in the community so that you have an understanding of, of the whole picture um, so you can develop a, a pretty comprehensive management plan and maintenance plan going forward. We've dealt with communities where, you know, they have some select trees that they're concerned about. We can certainly deal with that. And, and, and that's always a place to kind of start is to kind of identify, you know, areas that are problematic and kind of start from there. And you can build off of that. Um, the key, like I said, really goes back to understanding, you know, that, that trees have value in the community, trees enhance communities in, in a variety of different ways. And so if you start with that kind of framework, it, it makes it a lot easier for people to understand that. When people devalue trees, they think, well, it's just a tree or that tree's going to fall and hit my house. And so they lose sight of that, the actual value of the tree and what it's contributing to the community. Then, then you get some real issues, but we can come in and, and look at, uh, you know, groupings of trees and stuff like that. Uh, you know, I have a community up here in Pasco that we've worked with, you know, they have 13 feature trees, unfortunately. The way their association is set up is the homeowners actually have that private property. And so we have a lady that was told by somebody who claimed to be an arborist, turned out they weren't, uh, that the tree needed to be removed. But this was one of the 13 largest trees that they had in the community. And so they called me in to do a special assessment, really determine the actual risk on that individual tree. And, uh, you know, when you have a community like that that only has about 85 homes, and you have 13 what we call feature trees, or some people might call them specimen trees, um, you don't just want to necessarily leave that up to an individual homeowner to, well, I'm just going to cut that tree down because it may or may not cause problems. You want to go in there and really address that and call on a professional to, uh, whether it's me or somebody else, to determine, is this tree really a problem or not another question that came in and this is kind of leaning back towards what we were speaking with earlier in regards to permitting and the, what the county or the the government state laws say do you assist with finding out if the county or government entities will allow a tree to be removed sure a lot of times what that's going to entail is actually doing a formal tree risk assessment, writing up a report and submitting that. So let's say for example, you have one of these large specimen trees in your community. You, you would wanna do a tree risk assessment and determine is this, does this tree really pose a moderate or high risk of failure? And sometimes that can be identified pretty easily. Sometimes that's gonna to have to go through it an entire process. Obviously, if a tree has this big, huge gaping cavities and is leaning right over a home, <laughs> then it kind of already meets that test. But believe it or not, 90% of the time, uh, in many cases, the tree doesn't necessarily need to be removed. Maybe it's just a matter of removing a few limbs or parts of the tree that are that are causing a, a problem maybe the whole tree doesn't need to be removed so you know that that's where 
you know, we really kind of come in and look at these things and, and we can assist working through with a local ordinances, whether that be in Tampa or Hillsborough County, Pinellas County, or the specific jurisdictions. I have a question. Have you worked with some CDDs? I have not. You know, I, I, I'm still trying to kind of wrap my brain around CDDs and, and what that is. But in, in essence, my understanding is they're, they're very, very similar to homeowners associations. So I haven't actually worked, at least as far as I know, formally with a CDD. It's more working with homeowners associations. Okay. I would love to work with CDD, though. Whose responsibility is it to know if a tree is on common area, uh, the government-owned land, or homeowner's land? You know, I guess what they're speaking of is sometimes you run into an area where it's kind of a questionable area, maybe a tree sitting on the line or something. Yeah, that gets into a whole another can of worms um if the tree is sitting on the line the best thing to do in that instance is to actually have a conversation with the other owner and kind of come up with an agreement um you know and this, this is the kind of stuff that make great court cases and that's not where any association wants or should be in essence you know, once a tree crosses the threshold of the property line, anything above, um, you know, tree limbs growing over, you can prune those back. Uh, but obviously, you can't kill the tree. You know, so that that's one thing. But it, it gets to be a whole bunch of legal stuff. And again, I'm not an attorney. That's not my area of expertise. I know a lot about that stuff. Where I see most of the problems in existing homeowners associations is where the homeowner owns the land, but the land itself is treated as common ground. And so, for example, I've seen rules and regulations written up where the homeowner is responsible for caring for the tree, but the association's going to maintain the lawn and the shrubs around the home. But the homeowner's response, so basically what's happening in the bylaws is they're passing the buck of the tree care onto the homeowner. I don't feel like that's a very appropriate thing. If if you're cutting the lawn and maintaining the shrubs, I think the association should also be fully responsible for caring for and maintaining the tree. You know, I, I have a community here uh, locally that they prune the trees, but the homeowners are responsible if the tree needs to be removed. So then it kind of opens up that question, well, if the association doesn't properly prune the tree and causes that tree to die, then the homeowner is responsible for the removal. It, it doesn't make it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And so I think in a lot of cases, you know, and this is one of the things that we with platinum tree management planning, is we actually come in and look at the rules and regulations and make some recommendations to the board and to the community as far as ways that they can improve these existing rules and regulations that may have been crafted back in 1985 when the trees were teeny tiny and nobody ever thought that they would grow to be these 30, 40 inch trees. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. I was just talking to somebody about that, a landscaper about that the other day that he's, I said, you know, how you drive down a community road and you look at some of these trees and you could tell that at one time it was beautiful. And now, like, for instance, the palms get so tall that it's not a, appealing looking anymore because all you see are the trunks of the palm trees <laughs> because they're so tall now when it comes to palm trees, is there a specialty thing that you have to do? Cause I know they're very, they're considered you can replant them. Yay, yay, nay, no. Uh. Typically, if the palm is fairly large, I probably would, or is large, I probably would not recommend replanting it. You know, it really depends on the species and the location. And that, that's, that's one of the things that you want to be looking at, too. Probably the number one issue that I get calls on, Carrie, 
Our community is calling because their sidewalks are being damaged or the driveways are being damaged by the trees. And what can they do? The roots. It's the roots of the tree have grown. And most of the time, it's because the tree was planted too close to the infrastructure. So it's understanding for a given area, is a tree going to be suitable for that or not? And there's formulas for that. You know, it goes to good planning, really. Jared and I have an upcoming presentation on developer turnover. And, you know, a really good piece of that would be understanding, I guess you could probably answer this now, certain trees are going to be planted along the sidewalks to for the for the look of everything but you may be able to walk into a new community and go that needs to be moved right away because that's not gonna your your sidewalks are gonna be all up exactly. so i think maybe that's a good point in developer turnover jared is us adding something like that to the list to say this is something you may not think about now but how long john mm-hmm. three or four years down the road the, the, pro- the problem is carrie Five years down the road, those trees, in many cases, are going to double in size. And then, so so I got into involved with the community, and they're they're running into exactly this kind of issue where the sidewalks are beginning to buckle, the curbs are getting damaged, yada yada yada. The communities are only thirty years old or thereabouts. Had the, some of these issues been addressed early on, they wouldn't be faced with having to potentially remove and or have to replace all these trees. Now, like I was dealing with one community and the association there basically removed almost every tree that was between the sidewalk and the road. So they removed 70% of the trees. So now what do you have? A dust bowl. Right. And, and, I mean, these weren't small trees. You know, you're probably looking at, you, you know, ballpark, $1,000, $1,500, $2,000 per tree to remove. So now you're looking at a huge capital expense and having to do a special assessment to the homeowners because the sidewalks are being damaged. And then you're having to come back in and replace the trees. And what are you going to replace the trees with? Years and years down the road, there's no telling how many, like, I, because I got, I have one of those beautiful, huge oak trees in my backyard. Mm-hmm. And that, the roots on that thing are crazy, right? So, right. I'm just kind of wondering, what kind of trees are they planting? I mean, because I'm sure the developer will plant, like, certain, they probably plant several palms. They probably plant more inexpensive style trees. and And then... Is there like a rule of thumb that they need to be so many feet away from sidewalks and whatnot? There are some guidelines out there that have been fairly recently published. Um, You know, unfortunately, most of that's actually dictated by the um, by the counties or the town. As far as, you know, you're required to have X number of trees per a lot of times they use a formula on an impervious area versus pervious area. Um, there, there's a number of different ways that they calculate that, but oftentimes that's dictated in the planning stages with the with the um, local municipalities. So there's no way of getting around it then. Well, the problem is, is you know, think about it from from the developer standpoint. They want to get in with the least amount. Uh, investment as they can, generally speaking. Mm-hmm. Exactly, Jared. Oaks have more points than palm trees. So that's you're talking about a, a point-based system, and I've seen that in, in a number of municipalities as well. There's a variety of different ways it's calculated. Again, it goes back to selecting the right tree based on the space available. And that's where we're going wrong in these communities. I'm sorry. You cannot plant a live oak when the sidewalk is five feet from the curb and expect that nothing is going to happen to that sidewalk as that tree matures in 30 years. 
what's going to end up happening is the sidewalk is going to get heaved. And then what I talk with a lot of clients about goes back to the tree value. Now that live oak is 30 inches in diameter. You're looking at, you know, if you had to replace that tree with a like size tree, it would probably cost $300,000. So you're going to cut down to that much tree value and replace it with a tree that's going to cost $500 to plant and install. And you're exactly right, Jared's saying here, most of the time the manager or management company has no say in that because the tree program with the developer, because we only come in once the homes are starting to be built and or occupied. So they may already be installed. And you're absolutely right, Jared. But this would be when you're getting into that developer turnover phase, that would be the right time to bring in that consultant to actually go through and assess that and make some recommendations. A lot of times what I see is poor uh, plant stock that has been planted. So, so it's like you go through and, and kind of identify, well, these are all the trees. And you say, well, I can tell based on the quality of the plant material that these 10 trees aren't probably going to last. Let's pull them out. Let's maybe transplant a few trees over here and make these adjustments to try to get to a place where you can have a better community forest. Oh, so, okay. Help me understand this. <laughs> the developer, cause this is going to be you and Jared probably pitching in on this discussion. And maybe this is some better that we leave this for the developer turnover. But I'm, what I'm confused about is I'm picturing a community being turned over and the trees being very young so that mm -hmm. if you had to pull them up and you could possibly replant them. Um, it, oh, possibly. Possibly replant them. I'm just wondering like what kind of cost, because if it's a new community that's just being taken over by the developer, there's, again, Jared would have to answer this, but there's not a lot there. There's not a lot of funds there to, handle certain right. things like this so having a consultant come in are you going to come in and say all these trees two miles down this roadway here are way too close to the sidewalk and we got to get them moved back or you know what i mean I, yeah i understand exactly what you're what what you're saying is you know what do we do with when we're in a situation where we have limited funds mm -hmm. going in understanding that on the front end and then you know, and this, this goes back to that thing of, you know, why I recommend, you know, really assessing all the trees in the community so that you have an understanding because when you have that understanding, now you can begin to manage the problem and develop a plan based on a reasonable budget that, you know, 30 years down the road or 10 years down the road, you're not running into these kind of these hidden costs. And you know, Jared puts in here, you know, some oaks under five years may need to be moved away from foundations. That's a huge thing that I see in a lot of these communities where, you know, developer has come in and they plant these, these tiny little trees because it looks cute. And 10 years down the road, the tree's like beginning to damage the home. And it's like the tree never should have been planted there. It should have been planted in the front center yard. But from a sales standpoint, it doesn't necessarily sell the home. And I'm not trying to knock any developers here. You know, I, I understand their framework, but they're looking at it from, we want to develop this property and move on to the next. I'm looking at it from the perspective of here's a tree. What is going to be the best scenario that we can put that tree in to get that tree to live to be that 75, 100, 300 year old tree that we all want. I want to, we're running past an hour now. So what I would like to do is kind of close out with you telling us a little bit about platinum tree management and just how we can reach out to you and what should we ask for when we reach out to you and kind of what your game plan would be when you first start looking at a new community? Sure thing. Again, I'm with Platinum Tree Management. You can reach me uh, via email at john s at platinum 
treemanagement.com. I'll put that in chat here in a moment. Our goal is to empower communities to make better tree management decisions. So our focus is we're not a tree company. We basically act as a, a consultant for communities where we can help develop management plans for them. We can look at you know smaller projects as far as like tree risk assessments and things like that as well, developing plant health care programs, a, a number of different things. Our focus is more on the management of trees as opposed to the maintenance. And there's a big difference between the two. I like that though, because you know, when you think about it, there's more of a trust factor there with the client and you guys, because you're not coming in saying we're going to make money off of cutting all these trees down. You're consulting and then you're absolutely. Saying, I think Jared mentioned this to me, you know, him and I've talked a time or two and he's like, you wouldn't hire the roofer to come out and develop a management plan for all the roofs because you'd end up re-roofing the whole community. <laughs> and I think the same thing kind of goes, exactly. it, it holds true for the trees. And again, trees are our big investment and you want to make sure that you're planning for them the right way in a way that makes sense for each association. And that's going to vary. I'm putting in the chat section a link that will take you straight to John's profile on the Cam Matrix. So you can go in and follow him. Uh, you're going to be posting some educational stuff for us on the Cam Matrix, John? That is the, the goal. Absolutely. John doesn't like that I put everything under landscape, but I'm trying to explain to him. We, we just try to keep it all under one category. So we generalize it and we have to do that for topic. I questions. understand. Okay, I want my own category, please. I know, I know. You stop it. You can't have what you want all the time. This isn't Burger King. So anyway, we want to thank you for being here with us, John, and taking all the time to answer all these questions. I want to thank everyone who showed up today. And Jared said, change it to landscaping and trees. Jared, you stop it. I, I, I like the way Jared's thinking. That's a compromise. I know, I know. I might, I might. Let's, let's see. There, there's more things that are our higher priority right now, unfortunately, but no, I agree. Maybe that should be, I should do that pretty quickly. Any last comments you would like to make John in closing? I would just like to thank everybody for asking some questions. Looking forward to doing this again very soon. It's always a lot of fun. Love answering questions for people. Well, thank you so much for being here today. And I look forward to communicating with you back and forth on the Cam Matrix. And again, if you'd like to reach John, I will actually put his profile um, on the link so that if you are watching this via recording, you'll be able to just click on that and it'll take you to his profile and you can start a chat with him. He's, he's here to answer any questions that you may have. So thank you everybody for joining us and you guys have a wonderful week. Thanks. Thanks, Carrie, for having me. I appreciate it.